All right, everybody. Well, our next panel is uh, one that is uh, particularly important to hear to us here in the Northwest and, and here in Montana. Uh, as everybody's aware, Montana has one of the highest percentages of uh, Native American populations in the country. Uh, our tribal communities are very important to us. And as has been pointed out repeatedly throughout the day, uh, many of our tribal communities have been kind of left disconnected from the National Transportation Network. And uh, passenger rail service, uh, has, could be a, a potential boon for many of our tribal communities, both here in Montana and across the, the wider Northwest region and across the nation, in fact. Uh, so that's what this panel is. Now, uh, just real quick, uh, we've had some changes to our uh, participants in this panel. Uh, thanks to our ongoing struggles with air service in this country, not train service, our, uh, our two panelists that were supposed to join us from the Yakima Nation out of Washington, uh, Miss Little Bull, and, uh, and her assistant, Miss Miller, uh, they got uh, they got hosed on their on their flight today, and uh, <laughs> from my understanding, last I heard, were stuck somewhere between here and there, and unavailable uh, to join us remotely. So uh, we've done some last minute uh, rejiggering here. Uh, so joining us instead, uh, instead of them, uh, we're going to have uh, well, we got a couple of our panelists here. We got. Uh, our moderator, uh, Martin Charlo, I'm going to bring up here in a minute. Martin is actually with the is a CSKT tribal uh, council member, and Martin is also uh, the uh, ex officio representative of the CSKT on the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority Board of Directors. Uh, also, we're pleased to have joining us remotely uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Tribal Affairs, Orlando Teller. Uh, welcome, Orlando. And uh, with him, uh, also out of uh, his office, I believe, if I'm right on that, is Milo Booth, um, also joining us, working there with Orlando, out of the USDOT uh, Office of Tribal Affairs. And uh, I see that uh, Ms. Gorno has joined us up on the stage here, too. Uh, she might have a thing or say to, uh, from the Northern Cheyenne perspective. So with that, I'm going to welcome Mar Martin Charlo up here to uh, lead this panel and tell us how passenger rail service can benefit our Native American communities across the Northwest. Hessel uh, Hall, Pesia, um, Lumlunch, thank you everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Martin Charlo. As he said, I serve as the Tribal Council Secretary for my tribe. Um, I've had the honor of serving on our Tribal Council for the last two years, so it has been a whirlwind of COVID and um, passenger rail. Um, I appreciate everyone that's still here. I hope you guys got lots of caffeine before this, so my monotone voice doesn't, um, and my dry humor doesn't, you know, put you to sleep. So with this, today has been a really fun, uh, Kind of exercise in, in transportation, communication. Um, I thought I was going to be here myself, and so I'd ask a question, I'd run over there and then run back, and you know. So, thank to all the panelists that can make it today. It's been a great um, day so far. Um, hopefully, we can kind of enlighten you a little bit on tribal um, involvement with this authority. Um, so, again, the the the. You know, the stories of me traveling from Seattle to Whitefish have already been told. Um, you know, the, the history of our tribe, um, when settlement came, um, you know, we sent our leaders back and forth to Washington, D.C. via rail um, to negotiate treaties, to talk to the, the president about what was going on during that time, the encroachment of settlers, um, the change of our way of life. And so trains have always been a really important part of our tribal history, um, you know, there's also the negative part about, it, you know, the inner, the Continental Railroad um, coming across, you know, we, one of the panelists was talking about that earlier about how, you know, land was given um, out to, to the railroads. In reality, it wasn't given, it was stolen and, and then um, subsequently given away. But, you know, as Native people, we persevered, we've moved on, um, we've always embraced technology, um, and that's kind of where I'm at with this. That's why I became involved. My, my grandfather worked for the uh, Northern Pacific Railroad. Um, and so it's something where I've had stories about that um, my whole life and, and his involvement with that. And so when I was asked to fill in for our, our tribal uh, chairwoman on this, I, I was a little reluctant at first. But once I started kind of thinking about my own history and, and my tribe's history, 
Um, my family history, uh, it, it really became something that I, I got behind very uh, strongly and hopefully I can, you know, represent well. Um, the, the biggest thing, you know, with, with rail that, that we see, I think it was touched on before, is, um, you know, the environmental impacts or lack thereof. Um, I think that that's something that we've, we've looked into. If you guys have ever driven up the 93 corridor in western Montana, say from Missoula to Glacier in the summer, um, that is a, a uh, death trap waiting to happen. Um, and we have to travel those roads every day. Thankfully, the tourists only have to do it once in a while. But something like a, a, a rail, passenger rail, that could alleviate some of that um, would be definitely be great. Um, so I originally was slated to be a panelist, so that was my little spiel. I will kind of go down the line, um, allow people to introduce themselves. Um, I think that we will go with the, uh, the highest ranking official. Um, Orlando, could you um, go ahead and just kind of introduce yourself, um, tell us your experience with your uh, flights and how great they were versus uh, trail, uh, rail travel, so <laughs> thank you. Oh, yad eh, anot. Hello, everyone. She eh, nasht eje denet khachini in slon to ahead leni bashish chin. Tore chini da shi che do ashin da shinale ekut adunen shle. My name is Orlando Teller. I am uh, from the Navajo Nation. My four clans were shared uh, somewhere amongst the clouds. I may have a relative. Uh, my mother's clan is Zuni people adopted into the uh, Red Street Forehead Clan, born for the Water Flows Together Clan. Uh, and I'm your Deputy Assistant Secretary for Tribal Affairs. <clears throat> and uh, my journey actually uh, started yesterday as I left uh, my mother's homestead, my late mother's homestead in Chinle, Arizona, County Duchesne, um, uh, thinking that uh, I would have time to, you know, get to my hotel and have nice set of clothes and suits and so forth and uh, drove to Albuquerque, which is normally a three and a half hour drive from my mother's homestead. To, um, but I rushed because I was playing my grandsons and uh, um, checked my bag in Albuquerque, uh, ready to board uh, to fly to Louisville, where I'm at right now. Um, and um, Right before I was getting into uh, the jetway, they uh, stopped everyone and said, because of weather, we're going to delay. Uh, the weather in Denver was horrible, apparently. And uh, so we all walked off and sat near the gate. And um, I put my headphones on, thinking I was going to be, I mean, just watching the, the surroundings. People start standing in line. So all I, heard, all I saw was people scattering. And so I took my headphones off and I asked what was going on. They said the flight was canceled. So there was no way for me to get to Louisville um, last night. Uh, I patched work a flight itinerary um, late last night. Um, got to Austin, found out my flight to Austin to Louisville wouldn't happen. So early this morning at four o'clock flew into Orlando, Florida, and then from Orlando to Louisville. I got here around about 1.30 uh, and I stood in line at the luggage service and they didn't know they don't they didn't know where my luggage is. In fact I still don't have it. It was either still in Albuquerque, Houston, or Orlando. Um, and so I um, wearing my casual uh, ripped up jeans, shorts, sandals, and a tank top. I actually bought this uh, in Orlando. Um, I was wearing a tank So I looked totally casual. Um, and so I cursed um, uh, the airlines um, and uh, just thought, might as well just use it towards our discussions of um, an ironic situation for someone like myself. Um, and anyone else that was in the position and the situation, as we heard, um, there's a, a professional uh, Native woman that was is in somewhere between home and there. So um, long story short, uh, I'm here. I'm just waiting for a call to hear what my luggage is. Um, but I'm glad to be here on virtually. 
um, the conversations when it comes to equity issues and equity conversations are very important, um, particularly when it comes to federal rail administration. Um, I do believe that Amit uh, was uh, in person there and um, we have been working closely with FRA to assure uh, a, the conversation of meaningful consultation as well as technical um, uh, advisement uh, is part of our um, scope uh, when it comes to the Office of Tribal Government Affairs. And uh, the team that we have at, at the US DOT level is myself, Mr. Booth here as Tribal Director, and we're increasing our capacity in the Office of Tribal Government Affairs by including and, and hiring uh, a tribal senior advisor, and that's Mr. Eldridge Anko. We are also increasing that capacity, uh, so hopefully by the end of um, this fiscal year, which is in September, we will add at least two more um, tribal uh, affairs uh, staff to our team. Um, we are seeing um, the need for capacity building, the need for our own uh, office space uh, to provide uh, a respectful space for a meeting with uh, tribal nations and their leaders in the Office of Tribal Government Affairs happening. Um, we are definitely uh, looking forward to continuing our dialogue and our consultation to um, not only um, this organization, but also tribal uh, governments who uh, rely heavily or rely on um, rail. Um, being from Navajo, we have uh, several rail lines going throughout the southern part of Navajo. Um, there's conversations of um, utilizing the spurs uh, where the uh, once a Peabody mine um, was transferring coal to Page, Arizona as a potential transportation infrastructure that Navajo can uh, take over. Um, I know there's conversations throughout Indian country of such uh, infrastructure, so we're definitely open to those conversations and supporting and advocating. Um, and I will turn the uh, baton over to um, uh, the tribal director who is well-dressed, always well-dressed. <laughs> Here I am in this, you know, casual looking, very casual, um, and uh, excuse my, uh, my casualness. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Booth um, and feel free to ask questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Booth. Montana Orlando Teller's Hoiska Hoega Nakuru Rocky Boys. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you guys, even virtually. I love taking part in anything Montana. I'm Milo Booth, the Director of Tribal Affairs here in the Office of the Secretary. I'm born and raised in Matlakatla, Alaska, uh, on a small island in Southeast Alaska. So you probably know just by the deduction of that, that there was no rails up there. But uh, I do live out here on the East Coast now in Maryland, in North Potomac, and I've been out here about 10 years. Uh, I would point out that uh, Orlando's clothes aren't that bad. <laughs> and uh, if uh, the FRA administrator can call his buddy over at FAA and put in a good word to get him his clothes, I think we'd all appreciate that. Um, my children are enrolled in Rocky Boys, so I always enjoy doing anything with Montana, be it preferably in person. Uh, I'll deal with it right now virtually. Uh, but that being said, I'll turn it back to the moderator and the panel. I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you both for being on. I, I appreciate um, you uh, getting on with, with all the travel um, issues you had today. So um, with that, I was going to introduce Daryl, but he disappeared. So as Zoom world goes, um, I will just kind of jump into a question um, so for Norma. Um, oh, he's back. Well, Norma, since he, he left, well, I'll go ahead and um, kind of ask you. You introduced yourself a little bit earlier, but uh, maybe just explain why um, you felt it was um, a good idea to kind of partner up with Dave. And I know Dave can talk you into anything, but kind of uh, partnering with the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority, kind of what, 
what you thought the benefits could be for your tribal community. Thank you. Well, it's good to um, be up here. For the Northern Cheyenne and the railroads, they have not always gotten along. The railroads pushed us west because they wanted lands to build their railroads. Then they pushed us north so that they could continue to build their railroads. And so I'm kind of at a crossroads, me personally. I have a lot of history behind me with, uh, with our ancestors and what they went through with the railroads and the encroachment and the taking of our lands. But I'm also an advocate for um, convenience and being a part of the, the things that make America move. Um, and me personally, I worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and I became mobile. After my husband died, I just became mobile. And so my supervisors would ask me, do you wanna go to DC? I'd say, okay, I'll go to DC. Do you wanna go to Fort Duchesne? So I'd go to Fort Duchesne. And they said, do you wanna go to Alaska? I said, yeah, I'll go to Alaska. So I got to go to a lot of places that our normal Northern Cheyennes don't do. And so I, I recognize that there is power and being a part of the decision making. It's good to be at the table instead of having decisions made for you. So what someone else thinks that you need. So I, it brings me back to um, the tribal position, which we have always been opposed to development of any kind especially with our fossil fuels, railroads, those kind of things that, that dig up our earth and that mess with our, with our homelands. Because our homelands are things that we fought so dearly for. Our last biggest battle had been with the, Ton, or the Otter Creek Railroad in Southeast Montana. Our tribe fiercely opposed that. And yet here I am standing in front of you advocating for rail service with a passenger rail line. And that's why I say it brings me to a crossroads. We had a presentation at our council meeting that talked about the rail passenger service. And man, I perked up. I thought, man, that's a good idea. And uh, at that meeting, we didn't make a decision. So in June, um, I went on vacation to, to Alaska. And while I was gone, the tribal council took action to appoint somebody to represent them on this rail authority. And I came back and they said, Norma, you're on the board now. <laughs> so, so here I am. And... Um, I see potential and I see merit in what is going on. And to have a seat at the table, to me, makes a bigger difference than, than someone saying, oh, you don't need rail service or you need rail service. So I'm at a crossroads. So if, um, if you don't hear from me in a month or so, that means I've been impeached and... <laughs> and advocating for a railroad. So anyway, there's a lot of things that have happened within our tribe and a lot of historical trauma. But the best way to, to overcome that is to look at things through other people's eyes and look at what is available to us and how can we benefit from that too. But we benefit and we embrace it on our terms. And yes, and the reason that I'm for this particular um, rail is that it doesn't run through our reservation. 
It doesn't harm our environment, but then we get the benefits of it if it's brought closer. Like I said earlier, drive 325, 329 miles so I can get on a train so I can go somewhere. But it would also be better too if along the High Line that those, those uh, that Amtrak stopped at the reservation, stopped in Poplar, stopped in Harlem, where I can drive to Harlem instead of going all the way to Haver. So those are some of the things that we need to talk about. But you can't talk about them if you're not at the table because they don't, you know, they don't know your concerns. They, they don't know your issues. And so it's always better to be a decision maker sitting at the table. And so that's the position that I have taken personally. And I hope that it becomes a good fit for our tribe instead of always fighting and being negative that something positive comes from this. And the reason I say that, I, I shared with you my earlier story about my nephew. But in, 19, in 2019, I had some major health problems and um, I got really sick, but I got well. And my sister was the one that helped me to get well. She took care of me. And so I told her, <clears throat> excuse me, when I get well, I said, I'll take you wherever you want to go. I said, so you think about it. So a couple of days later, she said, she said, sister, I want to go to Seattle. I said, why do you want to go to Seattle? She said, well, I want to eat some fresh seafood. And I want to go to the Space Needle. So I said, OK. <laughs> so we, um, I let myself heal. And so once again, <laughs> my daughter drove us to Haver. We got on the train, and we went to Seattle. We spent six days there. We went to the Indian relays. We went to horse racing. We went to the casinos. We ate the best seafood. And she got to go to the Space Needle. <laughs> but it was so funny. I lost her over there. And I found her about 15, 20 minutes later. Oh my God, my sister was breaking um, cedar off of the cedar branch, <laughs> right, right in front of the space needle. I told her, you can't do that. <laughs> but there she was, but I wanted some cedar. So because of the rail system, I was able to treat my sister and repay her <laughs> for all the, um, the care that she took care of me. And so, from a, that's why I'm saying from a personal standpoint, I view things a little differently. And I am advocating for this, for this passenger service because there are a lot of Native Americans that would like to travel, that would like to go places, but they can't always af afford plane fare. They all you know, don't have vehicles, or if they do have one, you know, if they take the vehicle, then the family at home, and then they don't have a vehicle. So a train is a good way for them to experience the world and, and broaden their horizons. And, and I, see, I see a potential in that. And so that's why um, when they told me, OK, Norma, we appointed you to that board. You've got to start going to those meetings, I thought, OK. I'll give, it a, I'll give it a try. So here I am before you. Now, if you don't see me, you'll know why. <laughs> but I really appreciate the opportunity to look, at the op to look at the benefits of rail service from our standpoint. We, you know, we're, we're very rural. It takes us, I live 100 miles from Billings. But because there are opportunities out there and there are things that we can see and do and share. That's why I am supporting this rail service. And you know, I hope that something positive and something good um, comes of it. And so all of you that have that are sponsoring this or supporting it and have have the the funds and the big inheritance, you know, support this too.
Anyway, I really appreciate all of you being here today, and uh, I hope that um, you've learned things from us, and I have definitely learned things from the presentations about the benefits, because there are benefits to what we're trying to do, and I appreciate um, Dave for accepting me and making me be at the table and to be part of the decision making. Thank you. And by the way, I'm really jealous as a long, lifelong Yankees fan that I didn't get to go along on that trip. <laughs> if only I would have met them a few years ago. Um, and that's one thing about you know tribal communities, and, and I appreciate the diversity that we have um, throughout. You know, uh, people in the Southwest, natives in the Southwest, versus Plains natives or, or Plateau natives. They're they're so different, and so the challenges are are so much you know, diverse. I mean, we have a, you know, someone from Alaska who's an Islander and, and you know, they've been affected as well. Um, Daryl, I'll, I'll let, give you a chance to introduce yourself. Um, thank you for getting here and, and hopefully uh, Daryl Hernandez from the Ogallala, Lakota. Um, go ahead. Uh oh. We can hear you, Daryl. Go ahead. Oh, you muted yourself again. And if I have to say you're on mute one more time in the Zoom world, I'm <laughs> probably going to lose my uh, my mind. But you are muted again, Daryl. I'm not. I'm not sure what the criteria. Oh, here we go. Let's go, Daryl. <laughs> I'm lost. Are you guys there? We got you. Thank you. <laughs> there you guys are. <laughs> All right. I appreciate the, uh, my name is Dale Fernandez, um, legislative liaison to Chairman Kevin Killer at Oval Sioux Tribe. I do appreciate the time. Uh, uh, my wife, she brought me on board to discuss the, the railway. Um, I went to council um, to talk about the railway and what the, what everything was developed. And um, the council is very adamant and very proactive on trying to bring railways to South Dakota and supporting this. Um, but overall, um, obviously like uh, the lady before me was speaking on, um, not to too much piggyback off her, but you know, we have a lot of tribal members that, that drive and, and fly, you know, throughout the Great Plains you know, in, in a lot of ways, not just not, not just tourism, but the one thing I like to press on is, you know, for health, um, we have to transport, you know, a lot of our tribal members to Denver, um, to Utah, up in Montana. Um, and that's one thing that I brought to the council this year, talking about supporting and getting this uh, on board and breaking ground. Because um, this is a definitely a great beneficial um project that you guys are bringing forth into the area and uh, a lot of them are really really adamant to getting things going and uh, I'm kind of the, the olive branch to, for the OLC tribe uh, to get this thing uh, you know pushed forward and uh, to see many positive aspects and this this uh, atmosphere brings that type of, uh, of future of transportation uh, for a lot, not just for natives, but non-natives alike, and that uh, we can actually have that positive alliance come to South Dakota and Great Plains area. So I know my speech is a little bit short, but I do appreciate you guys' time, and uh, um, yeah, I'll definitely wanting to be able to get this thing supportive and, and push this thing forward. But I thank you for your time. Thank you, Derek. <clears throat> Yeah, I appreciate you being on, and um, yeah, sorry you couldn't be here in person. Um, Milo, if you could just kind of talk a little bit about the newly created office um, that you now run and, and kind of how that can uh, address some of our disparities in our, our Native communities. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, that's a really good question, and we're always excited to answer that because 
it always has to start with a thank you to all of the tribal leaders out there who worked so hard to push the bipartisan infrastructure law over the finish line. It did a number of things externally, and you're probably well aware of that through all of the notice of funding opportunities that have been hitting the streets and seeing the secretary out and the president announcing all of the big projects that came about from that. But if you turn around and look internally as to what it did, not just for me professionally where I work in an office, but for Indian country, it's really huge. When I was hired to a little over two years ago, I was hired into the Office of Government Affairs. So I still have the same title as the Director of Tribal Affairs. But one of the things I heard over and over again is it's really damn hard to find you, Milo. I, if I open up the website and I look for where's the Director of Tribal Affairs, it's just looking within a needle of haystacks. And, and so the folks in Indian country weren't happy with that. And so they lobbied hard. And one of the things that was in the bipartisan infrastructure law is it created an office of tribal government affairs. So not only is my position still relatively new, there's a brand new office that Orlando and I are at the helm of right now. And that's huge because it gives us representation or gives Indian country representation in not, not only in the flesh in a literal sense, but in a pragmatic sense of where this office is actually at. It'll survive the, the political appointees. It'll survive the career employees such as myself as you look down the calendar 10, 20, 30 years because that office is written in the law. And furthermore, I would even uh, note that in the omnibus that, that funded the federal government, it gave us an actual budget now that we can build on. And I know Orlando had mentioned that we had recently brought on a senior advisor, and that's true, but we're also excited about the two other positions he mentioned. Uh, we got clearance to put one on the street. Uh, it was for an admin associate, but it gives us our own administrative staff, so we're not borrowing people who don't work in the tribal spectrum on a day-to-day -day basis. Folks who do uh, usual admin stuff, great people, but they're not very well versed in self-governance. They're not very well versed in items such as the 477 law or sovereignty, on and on and on. This gives us the opportunity and the authority to bring on those people, to bring on the people who cut their teeth in Indian country, working in rail, working in aviation, working in uh, any of the modes that fall under the jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation. And so we're really excited about that. And then furthermore, it gives us a budget to run an actual program. And that's significant because when you step back and look at the Office of the Secretary, um, there's a lot of authority there, but there, are, there aren't too many actual programs. And, but there is a lot of programs within the Office of Tribal Government Affairs. And so we need the, that authority, but we also need the budget and we need the personnel. And so that law gave us all three check marks. And so when Orlando says that we're going to hire a couple people, that's really significant because if you turn back the clock just a little over 25 months or so, there was nobody here. There were no career employees, there was no office, and there was no uh, folks on the political side in Orlando's position. And, and so now that we have all three, we can continue to build on that. We can work with our tribal partners, um, such as you folks here, such as NCAI, so on and so forth. And it really gives us that pen literally in our own hands to write how we want this uh, office to serve Indian country. And it's not lost on me. And uh, so I, I take that really serious. I know Orlando does as well. Uh, and we're really excited to work with our tribal partners to help bring this into not only the forefront, but into a, a reality where tribes not only have an office, but they have people that they can connect with said office. Yeah, thank you very much for that. It's been a, a breath of fresh air working with the, the administration. And so um, Arnan, uh, Orlando, um, if you could kind of talk a little bit about uh, the infrastructure bill and how possibly it can have tribal communities focus a little more on green, um, you know, environmentally uh, uh, friendly uh, modes of transportation, especially with the rural areas that native uh, communities all all have. Um, you know, the, the previous panel talked a lot about Montana and its ruralness and the healthcare. Um, you, we are have a higher rate of diabetes and, and a lot of different um, <coughs> health issues that we will need, you know, tra reliable, safe transportation to. So I, I hope that you could maybe touch on that a little bit. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for that question. Uh, as we know, um, the bipartisan infrastructure law 
was signed in November 2021. Uh, and um, oh, that's my luggage that I can't believe. Did you hear the dog? <laughs> Milo, can you take over? <laughs> If you need to take a break uh, to grab it, well, well, go ahead. Yes, yes, hold on. Okay, my love, thank you. <laughs> well, that's throwing the baton in my hand when I wasn't expecting it. Um, <laughs> uh, could I ask the moderator to repeat the question? I apologize. Uh, just just uh, any anything in the infrastructure bill that can help tribal communities um, with more environmentally friendly transportation because rail is one of the uh, better modes of transportation, um, less carbon emissions, um, and then obviously down the road, hopefully we'll go even more green and have electric um, locomotives. But um, just if there's anything in the infrastructure bill that could assist tribes, um, if you could touch on that, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a lot actually, and it'd be, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that it expands beyond rail. I just, uh, stepping back, looking at it, the, the EV uh, side of things is huge. It, it created a joint office between the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation that is tasked with looking at EV, and it looks at EV in Indian country in all aspects. And so that really, really broadens the scope, if you will, in terms of where we can look at and, and how creative we can get in working with our tribal partners to help lower that cost of energy in Indian country. As you said earlier, I grew up on an island and gasoline is north, has been north of $6 for quite some time. And so, but that's also the case in rural America down here, as I like to say in the lower 48, that you see the higher cost of goods and services across the entire spectrum. And so how do we attack that? How do we help that as a governing agency or as, as a governing department? And part of that is looking at the, the, the EV aspect, but also how, well, when you say the bipartisan infrastructure law, when it has aspects that are, you know, the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvement Program, I think it's shorthand is Chrissy, if I recall. And so we want to take all of this and put tribes at the table. One of the panelists sitting up there, she mentioned that none of this works unless you have a seat at the table. And I think that this gives tribes a seat at the table. And what's important about it is that under the bipartisan infrastructure law, the White House Council for Native American Affairs, of which Orlando sits on behalf of the Secretary on, one of the things that they've been tasked with is overseeing all of the rollout for the bipartisan infrastructure law and ensuring that tribes have a seat at that table when, insofar as they hear about the opportunities as they come up and they have a chance to engage with said agency that's rolling them out. So whether that's FRA, whether that's uh, Department of Energy or Federal Highways or what have you, that part is, 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 is being moderated by the White House. And so they have their eyes on this. And so when we look at the amount of funding that is rolled out through something such as Chrissy and, 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 and how do we get it into the hands of, of our tribal partners, well, that's a huge, huge lift insofar as that it requires not only the announcement, but it also has puts a burden on the federal government, not, not a burden, but it puts a task that we have responsibility to make sure that, that we see through insofar as providing the, the correct technical assistance into the hands of the leaders in Indian country that are at the forefront of all of the transportation efforts. And so when we bring back uh, any form of technical assistance, we need to hear if it's working, if it's not working. I see Orlando has his luggage, his luggage back, so I could uh, step back and stop talking for a minute. Yes, um, if you could see all the tags on my luggage and it's been places, it's seen things. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid to open it up. But anyway, um, thank you for in, uh, in, for uh, laughing at my tragedy. <laughs> well, I appreciate you being on and, uh, you know, humor is one of the, 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 the traits that has got us through this. Um, you know, I, I yeah. want to extend the thank to Dave Strohmeyer. He's been a catalyst for involving the Native communities. Um, he actually did some of the heavy lifting himself that he asked me to do, so I owe you an apology for not getting, you know, Norma on and a few other things. Um, he is uh, a great leader. So um, with that, I believe we have time for questions. So um, 10 minutes. So anybody out there, I will um, wander around aimlessly. And, or, <laughs> 
Mine is a comment more than anything to Mr. Tiller. Uh, <clears throat> one of our speakers here this afternoon was supposed to be Holliana Little Bull from the Yakima Nation. And uh, she's in Louisville, but she didn't make it to Louisville. She's probably looking for her luggage. But <laughs> at any rate, she if you're there and she's there, she was really wanted to speak here today because she has a very interesting statement to make about the 1855 treaty with the Yakimas that was made when the Yakimas agreed to have a uh, passenger rail installed over the reservation. And those tracks are there mm -hmm. today, it's BNSF tracks. But she has a document uh, that sh she says, and some of the other tribal members have seen this, that states that uh, the tribe is guaranteed passenger rail service. And uh, they had this document, it was in the National Archives, and they had this document up until recently, they had it stored on a hard drive and this hard drive failed. So she's now in the process of going back to the archives and the BIA to try to recover this document. So if you see her, uh, tell her I said hello, and she'll want to talk to you, I'm sure, about that document. But I really miss her being here today because she so much wanted to talk about it. Thank you. Yes, I will look out for her. Um, the the historical uh, documents and um, uh, the, if you will, the treaties that um, that uh, need to be re-acknowledged and uh, addressed are certainly uh, conversations that um, our office will uh, start. Um, reviewing, re-reviewing, and, and engaging. I think uh, uh, when it comes to rail service, um, particularly in Indian country, and I've seen this on Navajo where uh, parcels of land throughout Navajo was um, uh, given to the rail line. Uh, and so what Navajo is doing now is um, uh, re-purchasing uh, those um, parcels of land uh, from those private ownership that, um, you know, uh, swapped it out for rail, uh, uh, alignment, um, and, uh, um, conversations with, uh, the, uh, uh, Yakima, uh, leader, I think we will certainly, I will definitely look out for her tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm curious to know if any of the panelists have an opinion on how rail could help uh, Indian youth in Indian country. We've talked a lot about health care for elderly folks on, on, in native country, but how does uh, a passenger rail formation potentially help you know, solve some of the social problems with uh, young people on reservations? Yeah, I'll just jump right in. I, I think two things that stand out to me. Um, as I mentioned, growing up on an island, we didn't have rail there, but we had boats and we had planes. And part of the challenges those don't solve, if you will, is what do you do in rough weather for access? You don't do anything. You just wait for the rough weather to pass, okay? And so rail gives the steady opportunity for said access to be in and out for Indian country, especially youth. When you look at youth sports, activities, um, Health care is a big issue, and then goods and services. It, it, it's able to bring in the good food. It's able to bring in all of the all all of the commerce that's needed for somebody who's 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 still in the developmental stage that is living under the care of somebody else. And said so the second thing I would point to is that it brings in an economic development opportunity, something that they can do for a career, they can look to for a career, and that it gives them a chance to to really grow from that. As you know, rail goes coast to coast, so it literally gives them a chance to go either side of the country as far as they want, okay? And so I think if we can really harness those two aspects, it can really create some positive environments for the Native youth. I know that uh, employment in Indian country, it's always way higher than the national average. I mean, it, it's just mind-boggling to me when I see everybody freaking out when unemployment hits 8 9%. I think I would kill for that back home. I would absolutely mm -hmm. kill for that. Like. Employment's pushing 50% back in Malakatla, and I know that it's not the only Indian res in the country that's like that. And so 
seeing having the the actual rail stops near Indian country where it stops, I think that's huge because that can really bring the employment to those smaller communities, to the larger tribes and the smaller tribes alike. And I think that's something right. that should be really seized upon. And I think it would be good. Thanks. Uh, to to jump onto that uh, conversation in our office, we are uh, not only uh, encouraging <clears throat> dialogue to um, address uh, employment, um, especially when uh, you know billions of dollars are going out, uh, particularly in Indian country. You know, how do we address the capacity? Uh, how do we address you know uh, um, uh, hiring our own to? Um, not only um, maintain, manage uh, infrastructure in our own communities, but, uh, you know, I'm not just talking about blue collar workers. I'm, you know, we're talking about um, white collars, the attorneys, the project managers, um, and the, uh, the engineers. And so um, what we are doing in the office, in fact, this is one of the deliverables for the White House Council of Native American Affairs, uh, that uh, Milo actually spearheaded was to engage um, uh, our Osibu office to really ask questions of um, hiring local and engaging uh, TCUs and vocational programs to ensure that we start sparking those conversations in Indian country right after um, the infrastructure law was signed. And so um, we're still going to continue doing that. We're going to still continue to engage our Osibu office in fact, um, I think um, we have several more meetings um, in the past and in the future to continue that dialogue because this is a such a potential, this bill, you know, they, they talk about it as a uh, once in a lifetime, once in a generation. Well, not only is it an uh, influx of phenomenal opportunities when it comes to funding, um, but also an opportunity where we can grab uh, the bull by the horns and make sure that our people are employed um, in some fashion uh, to maintain the infrastructure in the community. Um, and so uh, uh, Milo has been, again, spearheading those conversations um, and making sure that we always engage the question, you know, has anyone talked to the tribes? Has anyone engaged with the tribes? And so that, um, echoing conversation is a constant with this office. I, I think that uh, to be respectful of time, we'll, we'll kind of close up here. Um, thank you all for listening. I appreciate uh, you guys bearing with the, the nervous energy I had. And that'll be my cue. Uh, so <laughs> thank you guys. Um, and thank you all for, for being very flexible. And, and I hope that, uh, uh, go ahead, Arlindo. Okay, so um, thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I, I can share with you my uh, cell phone number. Um, it is area code 202-770-9255. And I am open to uh, conversations um, and uh, you know, the office is here uh, to uh, assist and provide technical assistance or just start conversing about um, potentials and recommendations. Great, thank you so much. And um, thank you for all the panelists. Uh, Daryl, I apologize, we didn't get a lot from you, but next time, I promise. <laughs> thank you. All right, yes, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Norma. Thank you, Orlando and Milo and Daryl, all for joining us. Uh, I just want to say uh, this morning we were really worried about that panel because what happened with Orlando and his uh, plane adventures and with Holly Anna and the Yakima and their plane adventures had left us wondering, and uh, it all worked out in the end, and it was a great panel. So thanks, Martin, and thank uh, everybody for joining in on that and, and informing us and educating us about how this can benefit an Indian country. All right, well, it is 5.50. We're going to take another one last 10-minute break uh, before our last session of the day. Uh, so uh, get up and do what you need to do and uh, be back here at 6 p.m. for our final session today. <laughs>